Hi, my name is Roy Rumbo. I'm an adjunct accounting professor at the University of North Texas, and I teach Intermediate Accounting 1 and 2. Uh, these lectures are posted to YouTube. They're primarily for my UNT accounting students um, in accounting uh, uh, 3110. Uh, however, I publish them to YouTube because I do uh, see that uh, people are interested in these and, and listen to them. Do not advertise them at all. And not looking to be a used tube star, make money, you know, probably that would be nearly impossible as an accounting professor anyway. And uh, I don't want to say I'm the, the greatest professor ever, but at least it's out there for you to be able to, to use if you like. I do try to, it's my best job to kind of keep it simple. I, I use the McGraw-Hill Intermediate Accounting Textbook and, you know, the source of my materials in these slides comes from that textbook. It's uh, called Intermediate Accounting. It's by Spiceland, Nelson, and Thomas. It's, uh, again, give them credit because it's just a great textbook. I really enjoy teaching it, teaching from it, and I think the slides are just uh, useful. And so uh, I hope this will be, um, you know, um, helpful to you. And so with that, I'm going to get started here. Time to get to work. And so today's lecture is, uh, again, um, for all of you taking intermediate accounting, wherever you might be, uh, I'm gonna really highlight review, this is review. Uh, very similar uh, to what you already hopefully know from taking principles of accounting wherever you, you've taken that. And there's, uh, for my students, there's nothing new here. I teach principles of accounting at uh, UNT. Now, here's the danger. Uh, and my son recently took intermediate accounting at a different school and I warned him, Hey, he said, Dad, this is all easy stuff. You know, I, I got it. I knew this stuff already. Well, I told him it's going to change. And so, uh, and it's going to change here in Intermediate Accounting One uh, at UNT in, with the YouTube, YouTube lectures, because uh, these first few chapters are kind of review, get you back up to speed, understand adjusting entries, the balance sheet, the income statement, things like that. And then we're going to dive into, you know, much more difficult. Uh, subject matter as we get into revenue recognition and accounts receivable and especially inventory. And why does it get harder? Well, there's a lot of nuances in the accounting. Why are there nuances? You know, business is, is getting more and more complicated these days anyway. So, and so the accounting is also getting hard and you got to know this stuff. And if it was easy, uh, you know, anybody could do it, right? And so, uh, although I think accounting it's relatively easy compared to, to some things, but in the fact that it's hard and we're, we have certifications like the CPA or the CMA, you can prove that you know it and you can make money. And so that's a really good thing here. So again, how simple can you get? Assets equal liabilities plus owner's equity. All the things we own is equal to the claims against the things we own. Either we owe people money and liabilities or we have a, you know, something for the owners there. Now, uh, stockholders' equity, the shareholders' equity, there's really important here because there's two elements of that. It's the amount that people have paid in capital, and we record that in a common stock account or sometimes it's called additional paid in capital account. Um, those amounts, that part of equity is the amount we've paid in. Well, guess what? Owners, why do they invest in the company? Because they want their share of the income this company is going to make. They believe this company is going to make a lot of money. So the second area of shareholder equity is retained earnings. Why do we use the word retain there? Because some of the earnings will be paid out in dividends. This is a return to shareholders. This is not an expense. And so here's the things that make up the income. Revenues plus gains minus expenses and losses. That's the net income that, that flows into retained earnings. So retained earnings at any point in time uh, reflects all the accumulated, since the beginning of time for this company, all the net income minus the dividends paid back. And so that's why we use the word retain because companies do not pay out all their earnings. They retain some back. And guess what? This is crazy. But that's what the owners wanted to do. Why do they want to retain it? Because they want to reinvest and grow the company. And so if the company grows in value, their investment grows in value. That's what we call capital gains for the owners of the company. 
For example, Amazon uh, has never paid a dividend. So you can look at their retained earnings and see all the net income they've ever, ever made. And so, uh, and they've taken those that retained earnings and they started out selling CDs and then they went to books and they went to the next thing and the next thing. Now they you can buy about anything on Amazon and it's worth, you know, probably nearly a trillion dollars. Well, that's not what it was worth in the first few years if you invested in, in Amazon. And so they retained all of their earnings. And so again, but where is that recorded? That's in the equity section. Why is it in the equity section? That's the owners, that's what they own. They own, you know, the part, their percentage ownership through their paid in amounts, plus their, their share, proportion share of the earnings. So let's look at uh, these four elements here that we're gonna think about. Double entry system means every time we record a debit, we also record a credit. And keep in mind, all the debits, therefore all the debits equals all the credits. And what is debit and credit? I have a, if you look at my introductory lecture, I have a whole almost conversation in a lecture about debits and credits. And so why do we have debits and credits? Debit is nothing more than a word that means left and credits nothing more than a word that means right. And so the left side of the balance sheet are assets and the right side of the balance sheet are liabilities and owner's equity. And so debits increase assets, credits reduce assets. On the other side, the right side of the balance sheet, credits increase liabilities or owner's equity, debits reduce those. And inside that we keep um, uh, accounts. Now, why do we have accounts? We could just have three accounts, assets, liabilities, or owner's equity. It would not be very meaningful. For, I'd like to, what assets do you have? You know? So we create accounts and you could have 10 accounts or a thousand accounts. And, you know, and so that lets us capture information for each one of these accounts that we might wanna put on the balance sheet and make it more useful for people. The general ledger, that's just a collection of all the accounts uh, that we've created. And then, you know, again, uh, there will be assets, uh, liabilities, uh, and a uh, paid in capital, revenues and expense accounts all sitting in the general ledger. And we'll see that here in a minute. And then the final thing I'd like to just talk about T accounts, really not um, part of kind of the accounting process, but it's used for instructional purposes. And it's, it allows us to put an account in a pictorial uh, manner that makes it easier to see and understand and capture the logic of accounting. When, when I work problems here in Intermediate Accounting One, you will see me using T accounts all the time because it's easier to get stuff right and get in and not miss something by having a T account. Back when I was the chief accounting officer sitting in my office, I had a big whiteboard there. If someone came in and said, I think we got a problem now in the business unit, um, I say, okay, let's look and see how they accounted for it. And I'll put on my board, you know, five or six T accounts for different accounts and say, how did they do it? They put debit here, credit there, and I look at that. And then we, on the right side of the board, we say how they should have done it if that was wrong. And then it kind of helps us put it in the picture and, and discuss it. So you'll see me use T accounts all the time and, and most accounts do. And so here is kind of what a T account looks like. You got the name of the account, it could be cash, accounts receivable, inventory, whatever. And then it looks like a T, right? Because we draw this T here. Then on the left side, we put the debits. On the right side, we put the credits. We might draw another line at the bottom, add up all the debits and credits to find out what the account balance is. And so this is what is referred to as a T account. Get ready. If, if you're working with me, you'll see a lot about it. What's a T account rule? Hey, debits, increase assets, credits, reduce assets, balances. Opposite, shareholders equity liability. Credits increase these and debits reduce these. You can say, think about this, is the left side of the balance sheet and these claims are on the right side of the balance sheet. Therefore, no more balance for assets or debits, no more balance for liabilities and or equity or credits. Here's kind of an example. A 40,000 was borrowed from a bank and a no payable, a liability was signed. Debit, the, the cash account for 40,000, credit the no, no payable account. And you could, you know, there could be multiple entries here later and we'll see what the balances of those accounts are. And so, uh, again, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, 
Uh, I think this is really just so basic, but you know, assets, uh, you know, you see where the plus and minus has come and therefore um, in uh, retained earnings, well, here's the income statement. Um, you know, they are primarily expenses, losses, and dividends are primarily debit balances and credit, revenues and gains are primarily credit balances. We do have two types of accounts. If we look at this process, there's permanent accounts that give us a point in time balance at any point in time. You could think um, balance sheet accounts like cash, accounts receivable, they're permanent in nature. And at any point in time, we could snap the line and we can see how much cash do we have? What are the, what's the balance of the accounts receivable? What's the balance of the inventory? But you know, revenue and expense accounts and dividend accounts, they're temporary accounts because at the end of the accounting period, we're gonna, what we say, close them out. We're gonna take them to zero. Why? Because we're gonna take their balances and we're gonna put them in to retained earnings. And, and we want them to go to zero because these are more like flow accounts. We wanna measure revenues over a period of time, expenses over a period of time. And so when that time is in, that accounting period's over, we, want to, we need to set them back to zero, put them in retained earnings, and they're start at zero. So now we can capture the revenues expenses for the new accounting period. We don't want to muddle them up. So all revenues, expenses, and dividend accounts, uh, and gain or loss accounts, they're called what we call temporary accounts. All balance sheet accounts, assets, liabilities, and shareholders equity, thing, accounts that end up on the balance sheet, if you will, they're considered permanent accounts. And their balance reflect a point in time, not a flow over a, a period of time. What does the accounting uh, cycle look like? And we're gonna, go, we're gonna walk through one, it's gonna take a little bit of time, but uh, during the accounting period, we're gonna be recording some uh, recording transactions. And so, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get invoices in or we'll get cash from a customer. And so we'll be, you know, recording uh, these uh, journal entries in the journal and they'll get posted in the, in the end of this period, they'll be posted from the, the, the journal to the journal ledger. And this is just every transaction just gets recorded during the accounting period. Usually this is a you know, slower time for accounting staff, easier time. This is when we get out at five o'clock and we go see our families during this time. But we're not done because adjustments have to be made to those uh, because of accrual accounting to get those right. And we call this the, I call it, I know the book called it, uh, I call it the closing process. So if you hear, oh, what's the accounting department? Doing? Oh, they're closing the books. The closing the books happens, you know, at the week or two weeks, three weeks after the accounting period ends. For example, for the year end of December 31st, it may take companies one, two, three weeks during January to do all the adjustments, adjusting entries, to get everything right so that they can report and prepare the financial statements, the last step. So we're gonna look at these uh, adjusting entries. And then finally, uh, all the temporary accounts, this is just like a no brainer work, simple. All the temporary accounts get closed to zero. And you know, some automatic accounting systems will do that for you, hit a button, close out all the temporary accounts. And so um, expenses that have debit balance, they'll get a credit. Now, well, you have to have a credit and debit. So we'll credit the expense account to take it to zero, and debit retained earnings. Re revenue accounts have a credit balance, debit those, and credit retained earnings. And, and we'll see that here later. So um, we're going to have to look at all the, the transactions that happen. And there may be some analysis of each transaction uh, during, during, this is just during the basic, we're in the first part. We're going to walk through this first part of the accounting period here in orange. And uh, that's just the basic kind of boring stuff we do. And uh, we record all the transactions that are happening. Sometimes they could go straight to the journal journal. Sometimes we'll use a special journal um, and we'll look at those at the end of the chapter, like the sales journal. And then at the end, we'll add up all the sales journal balances and then post that one big total to the general journal. Um, and every journal entry, even during the cutting period, the debits are going to equal the credits. We each journal entry that keeps us. We can never be out of balance as, as long as we do that. This thing. Uh, if I touch my mouse, 
Sometimes it jumps, I apologize. But, so we're gonna now go do all the um, transactions. We're gonna look at all these transactions. I'm not gonna walk through this here. These are things that we're gonna look at during the month of July. And after we get done with these, then we're gonna go do the adjusting entry. So we're just kind of you know, follow through this. Um, two individuals invested 30,000 in the, in the um, corporation. So each got 3,000 shares. So the company received 60,000 in cash. And it's gonna credit an equity account to call in common stock. And then we borrowed money on July 1. Debit cash, we received cash and we credit the notes payable account. If you go back, how much cash do we have now? $60,000 debit and a $40,000 debit. So we have a $100,000 debit. Note that this note, uh, we're gonna have to get into it when we do adjusting entries. Uh, there's a 10,000 note and a $30,000 note. There's interest associated with these, but it's not payable until the next year, July of 22 and July of 23. So these notes, we're incurring the interest during the month, but all we do right now is, you know, and it's gonna, is debit cash and credit the notes payable. But we're, we do our adjusting entries, we gotta take care of that interest. And we paid 24,000 uh, in advance for one year's rent. Well, like we saw um, in, in, the, in the last lecture, I think it was the last lecture, we talked about the cruel accounting. I think we had an example like this. Uh, I think that was in the previous lecture. Um, the company's gonna receive 20, is gonna pay uh, $24,000 for one year's rent. Well, they haven't used the facility yet that they're renting. So it's definitely not an expense. It's a special asset account that we call prepaid rent. So it's not an expense yet because we, we just paid it on July 1. We haven't really incurred an expense because we haven't used the facility. And that's a difference between cash-based accounting, which is really not appropriate, misleading, not allowed for public companies and accrual account where we measure transactions regardless of how the cash change hands or not. And so therefore we do not record an expense even though we pay cash. We have an asset, 24,000. Really think about this asset for prepaid rent. It's a right to use that facility for how long? One year. So we have an asset on our books, a right to use that facility. And then we, we credited cash that we paid for that. We purchased office equipment, debit the office equipment account, an increase in an asset, and credit cash, a decrease in another asset. So total assets have not changed by this transaction. One asset went up, cash, a second asset went down by the exact same amount. See how these debits and credits? They are idiot proof. As long as a debit equals a credit, your assets will always equal your liabilities plus your owner's equity. Now in this case, uh, we're gonna buy $60,000 of inventory, but we're gonna pay for it later. So we have a liability here, it's increased. The liability is called accounts payable, um, a credit of 60,000 and inventory is a debit. Now inventory is a special asset that um, is for um, you know, products that we plan to resell. So things that get recorded in the inventory account, that's our core part of our business. That's what we're gonna sell in the future and we buy uh, $2,000 of supplies with cash. So we're gonna debit our asset account supplies and credit our, our cash account. Again, like prepaid expense, uh, we'll only expense these supplies when we use them. Not, you know, again, we're not cash-based. It's not an expense. And here, look at, this is cool. We sold something and we sold merchandise that cost us 20,000 for $35,000 in cash. This requires two entries. One, debit cash for the 35,000 credit. We have delivered some inventory to our customer. And so we get, and at the timing of this matters during this month, you know, we, it was a whole bunch of transactions looked like, but we credited sales revenue. And guess what? We don't own that inventory anymore. It's gone. So we've got to do, how do we, how do we decrease an asset? We have to credit that asset. There's a credit to inventory. And then what do we call this? This is a debit to an expense. It's a very special expense account. We'll spend a lot of time on this later in, um, in Intermediate One. Uh, and so we're gonna debit a special expense account called cost of goods sold. This is directly related to the revenue. 
and then we sold some stuff on account, um, you know, on a on account, which means on terms that the people are going to pay for later. So here we credit our revenues because we delivered this this uh, clothing to a customer, the Briarfield School for Girls, and they they owe us thirty five hundred dollars. That is a legal right to receive that thirty five hundred dollars. That's an asset, it's a special asset, accounts, accounts receivable. Anytime you see the word receivable, think asset, asset receive, accounts receivable, notes receivable, those are assets. Again, this inventory is gone. So we're gonna credit the inventory account for 2000 and debit our special expense account, cost of goods sold. Now, I'm not spending any time on this, you'll, you'll really get inundated with this later. Um, there are two types of inventory system. One is perpetual inventory system where we're automatically recording inventory transactions as they occur. And uh, this is what most businesses use today because uh, accounting systems can handle this you know, so easily for us. Uh, periodic inventory system, um, we're gonna count the inventory at the end. And you, know, you do see this in principles of accounting a lot. And I use this in principles of accounting, I don't talk teach perpetual and principles of accounting. I teach the periodic to get the concept down, but we just count the inventory at the end, see what's missing. And then we record our cost of goods sold at the end in an adjusting entry. Okay, now we've decided, hey, we didn't need all that building. So we're gonna sublease a piece of that. Remember we rented it. A sublease is when, you know, we have a lease, but we're gonna lease part of it to somebody else. And that's called a sublease. And they're gonna lease a portion of the building to a jewelry store. And so in this case, we received $1,000 in cash, but we haven't done anything. We've given away the right to use part of that building that we're leasing, and we are gonna call that deferred rent revenue. In other words, this is the opposite of a prepaid expense. This is a deferred revenue, not real revenue, because we've done nothing to earn that revenue yet. It's a deferred revenue, a liability account with a credit. And we'll recognize revenue and we'll reduce this deferred revenue as our less, lessee who's leasing the building from us um, uh, uses it. And they've already prepaid for that. On their side, they would have a prepaid, you know, so, but we're doing entity level accounting, we're doing our account. And then on July 20th, uh, we paid for some of that clothing we bought. So credit cash, right? That one you gotta get right, you know? Credit cash reduces that asset, but guess what? We don't know that liability anymore. We don't owe them 25,000. That means we paid them. So we got to reduce uh, the accounts bill. How do we reduce a liability account? With a debit. And uh, we paid salaries to employees um, for the first half of the month. They worked for us for the first half. And so that was just salary expense and credit cash. Uh, I wonder about the second half of the month. Maybe we're gonna have to take care of that later in the next, in the uh, closing process. And uh, we received, you know, we sold uh, to the Briarfield Girls School, uh, you know, some clothing on account. And they owed us. Well, they haven't paid for all of it, but they paid for part of it. So we received cash, debit the cash asset, and reduce another asset, accounts receivable. They don't owe us that anymore. And we paid a dividend to our shareholders. So we're going to debit the dividend account and credit cash. And so, all these journal entries uh, just get you know, posted um, into the general journal. And uh, here you can see, look at all that cash. This is like a T account, right? All the cash transactions that happen. And so uh, every one of these gets posted to the account. So these journal entries, the measurement, the second interim, interim step is these get posted to the journal journal. So prepaid, remember that prepaid rent, 24,000? it went a debit to the prepaid rent account. And uh, we pay cash of 24,000, we credit that. Look at all these other transactions we just talked about. They're, they're sitting in the cash account, debits and credits, and our ending balance is 68,500. So that's how much cash it says we have on the books. And here's all the general uh, ledger accounts and, and their total balances. So you take plus debits minus credits, on each one of these, you end up with the ending balance in the general ledger. And that's true for here. And so now we're gonna take those balances 
and we're going to prepare uh, a trial balance. We call it unadjusted because we're 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 in that next step. We're getting ready to do all our adjustments to these balances for information that we know that's not yet reflected, not yet complete uh, for the financial statements. And we also check at this point, do all our total debits equal our total credits? And so here is a trial balance, unadjusted yet, we got more work to do, but these were the balances that were in the general ledger. And so we, you know, we add up all the debits, 174,500, we add up all the credits, 174,500. Now, what if these two were not equal? Man, that's a problem. What does that mean? There's an error somewhere. Someone is recorded a debit without a credit, or someone recorded a larger debit than a credit. Most accounting systems won't allow that, but I know uh, when I was trying to, you know, I was asking my director of consolidations and accounting, hey, how's it going? Are, are we close? She said, oh, we're out of balance, Roy. I don't know. I don't know why yet. <laughs> you know, and sometimes that's like looking for a needle in a haystack. And so that can be tough. And so, uh, you know, if you add all these up and they equal, it's like, woohoo, you're like, uh, it's a time to celebrate, but you can't fully celebrate because you got more work to do. We've got to make the adjustments so this can become a final trial balance. So the um, importance of this adjusting entry that we're getting ready to look at is to make sure we reflect uh, accrual accounting. Because basically everything we've done previously is we've recorded the trash, the, the cash. And we wanna make sure that we recognize all the revenues and, uh, and all the expenses are recognized. And when we recognize this, there's also uh, going to change the balance sheet, if you will. So when we look at adjusting entries uh, for accruals, there, there's two, two types, and it depends on whether the cash was already prepaid. Remember, we had two prepayments in those examples, prepaid expenses, and we received cash uh, up front for a rental, and that was a deferred revenue. So we either have pre prepayments or we have accruals. And these are things that are harder to find because we got to think about the liabilities and, and items. This is where cash is going to be paid later. So we have to really do some critical thinking about that and how much cash is going to be paid later. It may take some estimates in that. We, you know, we'll have to estimate that. But if we, you know, again, if we didn't book these, we didn't book these adjusting entries, we would have errors in the financial statements. So I think I talked about this uh, when cash precedes the expense or the revenue recognition. So here we paid cash up front uh, for that rent and that was a prepaid expense. Here, we received cash up front for a sublease, and that's what we call a deferred revenue. So prepaid expenses result that, you know, we're gonna acquire them in one period, and uh, prepaid expenses, they'll be expensed in the future period. So uh, when we expense it in the future period, we're gonna make an adjustment from debit expense, and we're gonna credit the asset. And so it's gonna result in, a lower net income and reduction in the asset. We'll see that here in a minute. Over here's an example, an adjustment for supplies. So um, we purchased $2,000 of supplies, but there's only 1,200 remaining. And so we kind of have to look. So we, we, we had 2,000, this is our T account. And this is how I would do a supplies multiple choice question, by the way, I always draw out a T account. Uh, when I do that in class, and I think I'll, I'll do that in the next lecture that you'll see with this chapter, we had a beginning balance of zero, we bought 2000 and we know the ending balance because how do we know it? We went out and counted our supplies. So what, what do we need to do? How do we make a $2,000 balance become a 1200 balance? We got to credit supplies for 800. Those are the supplies we used that are missing and used. Therefore, we debit supplies expense for the amount that were used. Here's a, a prepaid rent. Um, so we know we paid 24,000 for 12 months rent. So 24,000 divided by 12, every, um, every month we use that facility, we're gonna debit rent expense and credit the prepaid rent, the asset. And so we see here the T account, that a balance was 24,000 
minus 2,000. This is an asset account, uh, ends with 22,000. And we record rent expense. Why do we record rent expense? Well, we use that building for a month now. When we prepaid it, we had not used it on the July 1, whenever we paid that. Um, but now we've used it. And so this is an example of a, an adjusting metric. And then um, for long-term assets, we're going to record, remember this from um, principles of accounting, we're going to record uh, depreciation expense. And so if this office equipment we bought for 12,000 could be used for five years, then uh, 60 months, then um, the expense is 200 bucks per month for all of those five years. This lets us allow, allocate that $12,000 cost into the little time periods, the monthly time periods that we're using it. Here, we debit a depreciation expense. And we credit uh, what's called a contra asset. And that's why we leave that equipment account clean with that $12,000. So we know what we originally paid for it. And we have an offsetting account with a credit balance of two hundred. dollars And so deferred revenues. Uh, here, uh, we originally, you know, the adjusting entry, we originally, you know, credited liability and, and debited uh, cash because we received cash from this. So we're going to credit the revenue as we, over time, and we're going to debit the liability. And it's been a lot of time. Let's just look at an example. Here, we sublease space with jewelry, a store for, uh, for $500 per month, and they paid us $1,000 in advance. Uh, for the first two months rent. But uh, guess what? They only used it for half of a month. So now they've used it for half a month. We get to recognize rent revenue because they've used that. And guess what we get to do? We're going to reduce our deferred revenue liability we set up. So here's the deferred revenue account. Remember, we, we paid, we received cash at this case of $1,000. And we owed them the right to use that, um, that space. And now they've used um, half of a month of it. Now the $1,000 were for two months to $500 a month. And so we can reduce that thousand by the 250. Now we only owe them another uh, one and a half months left uh, that they paid for that we owe them that. So that still stands as a liability, deferred rent revenue of 750. Now we're gonna record real revenue, not deferred. This will go to our income statement. So accruals uh, are about cash flows that happen after um, an expense or revenue recognition. And so let's look at some accrued um, adjustment entries for accrued liabilities. So remember that they paid employees 5,000 for the first half of the month, but the employees didn't go home. They kept working for the second half of, of July, but they're not going to be paid till early August. That's how most payroll systems work because it takes time to process all the payroll information, and the timesheets, and get all the withholdings right. The company just can't turn this around that fast, and so they're going to be paid later. But guess what? They provided uh, the company a benefit of two weeks, the last half of July, so we need to expense that when it occurred. That expense occurred when the employees were there working for us, and so we're going to debit that salary expense and credit a salary payable. So this is an, an adjustment entry. So adjustment entry, we're gonna get the income statement right with all the complete expenses and we're gonna credit um, the liability. Now interest, uh, keep in mind what interest is. Interest is, is the cost of using someone else's money and every day we're using someone else's money, there's an interest cost. Now we can have interest income, which we don't have in this example, but someone is using our money. And so every day that's outstanding, there is an interest cost. So here, now that remember this interest is not gonna be paid until 2022, go back to the example there. And so this 40,000 times 10%, you know, um, every month, this is, this is how I, I would do this problem, by the way. By the way, interest rates are always 12 month rates always. And that just makes it easy for us. So, and this is exactly how I do one of these problems if you see in the multiple foot. Go calculate the monthly amount. So 40,000 times 10%, that's 4,000, divided by 12. So every month, this loan is outstanding. 
every month we're using their money, there's an interest expense, even though we don't pay it for another year. Yeah, we're not on the cash-based system. <laughs> you know, we, we don't record interest expense either when it's paid, when it's incurred, when it's happened. And so this month, we use that money all month. So there's a real cost, $333. Every month, this $40,000 is outstanding. Um, we're incurring the expense of 333 that we'll pay, pay later. So there we go. Debit interest expense for 333. That will go to the income statement and credit a payable. We owe them that. If we paid the loan today and just we said, here's your 40,000 back. If we paid it July 31st, they say, well, you owe me 333 for the interest. You know, you don't get to uh, forego that interest. And then receivables. Now, here's an example. Well, if we loaned another company uh, $30,000, someone else is using our money, same kind of thing. And so now someone is using our money, that's non-interest expense, that's an interest revenue for us. So we take 30,000 times 8%. So every, every month that's out divided by 12, every month that's outstanding, we're earning 200 bucks, but it will be, we'll receive the cash later. So therefore we debit receivable and credit the interest revenue. And so we get into, uh, so now that we've done all these adjusting entries, now we're gonna be back to where we were before, but now we have new balances in the general journal. We, we've created all these journal entries. So therefore we've got to go again, see do all our debits and credits match. And here was the unadjusted trial balance that equaled 174,500. But now uh, the adjusted trial balance, the more correct one, by the way, the more complete one, Remember, uh, completeness is part of our uh, quality, our uh, um, part of the conceptual framework is important. And this is 180, debits and credits equal. Um, we're good there. Look at all the new accounts that we've added in here that didn't exist over here. Cost of goods sold, salaries expense, supplies expense, rent. You know, now we have much more complete and better information. Here's the rent revenue. So all this stuff now, uh, is going to you know, better reflect uh, the results. And here we go. Now, now we're in the fun part. Let's go create some financial statements. And so we just pull information off of the trial balance and we create um, with the revenues and expense accounts, not dividends, dividends is not an expense. You know, my students always miss that. And I tell them this a million times, dividend is return of cash to owners. That's an equity transaction. It's not part of running our business. That's a, a choice that we make uh, around our capital funding from our investors. So it's nothing to do with the income statement. So we have revenues uh, and then all the expenses and revenues minus all these expenses, 29.17, our net income. No, we got some subtotals here along the way, gross profit and then operating income, a subtotal from all the operating expenses, and we have some other income to get the net income. When we look at the income statement, um, this is a multi-step format, and that's what I expect you to know, and we'll talk about that when we get to the income statement. Um, there's another statement called comprehensive income. Um, again, I think I talked a little bit about that last time, uh, that is required of, you know, by GAAP. In this simple example, we would not have any comprehensive income, but it would be a statement or some other types of transactions where the FASB does not require these items to hit the income statement. Uh, usually it's a big change in a liability account, or another uh, balance sheet account, and we wanna get the balance sheet right, but the FASB has decided in their infinite wisdom that boy, all these changes for some of these balance sheet items, it would overwhelm the income statement, could make the income statement misleading. Therefore, we put them in a special section uh, called uh, accumulated other comprehensive income. And the FASB now requires a statement of comprehensive income where you would see all the changes in that equity area. And you could put that in a single continuous statement of comprehensive income. So you come down to net income on the income statement and to add these items to the bottom. I don't know anyone who does it. Everyone just puts a second statement. And generally, to be quite honest, nobody really looks at that. They're more focused on the income statement because some of these things are, 
there are you know substantial changes, economic changes for the corporation, but it's so usually these things are so disconnected from the operations, and that's why the FASB did not want them to go straight to the income statement. And as we get further in the intermediate accounting one, especially intermediate accounting two, you're going to run across these items. We'll see how we do this. Uh, so the balance sheet, and I've talked about current assets and current liabilities. Uh, current assets are things that'll be converted into cash in uh, in a year. Current liability things will be paid in cash. And so, uh, if you have a cloud supplied balance sheet, you're going to separate out uh, the current versus the long term assets and the current versus the long term liabilities. Um, again, non current assets, things like property, plant, and equipment. So these are things that are going to turn into cash or be used longer than one year. Long-term liabilities, things will be paid longer than one year. And so that's important. In shareholders' equity, we can show uh, uh, both the paid in capital and retained earnings separately. That would be very important. Uh, the statement of, uh, so we don't see that yet. And then finally, the statement of cash flows, uh, that takes all the cash in and cash out, cash receipts, cash disbursements for the whole year. It's another flow period. In this case, a whole month, whatever accounting period we're looking at. And we divide those cash receipts and disbursements into three categories. Operating, cash, you know, uh, from or used by, you know, it could be a negative number by operating activities. In investing activities, that's the only about the acquisition or the sale of long-term assets. And then financing activities, kind of where the company is getting its money from. So if you think about this, from operating activities, we want a really high positive number. We want to see uh, cash flow from operations is a big, good number. Uh, in the, the companies I work for, uh, part of our bonus structure was ju not just net income, but also cash flow from operations, because that's areas we could control. Now, investing activities, we'd rather that be a negative number, that uh, the companies are investing in the future. And so the cash flow statement tells a different story. If you see really strong, positive cash flow from operations, it's a feel-good story. And if you see big investments, big negative numbers here investing, we know they were investing for the future. You know, think about a restaurant chain. Maybe it's a really successful restaurant that has one or two restaurants in, in, in Dallas or wherever. And they're so successful, they say, let's open three more, five more, 10 more. And so they're investing in new restaurants. Well, guess what's going to happen to their net income and their cash flow in the future? It's going to be higher, right? And so if you see big investments, um, that's a positive story. And that's what you want to look at that. Let's look at another example. Really good cash flow from operating activities, zero investment activity. Well, how are they going to grow? You know, I'm investing for the future. I want to invest in companies that are going to grow. If they're, if they're just hoarding all their cash, you know, whatever they're doing, uh, this is zero, it's question mark. Why is it zero? You'd want to understand that. Um, and then financing activities is more, where are they getting their money from to fund um, their uh, investments or their operating activities? And so um, that's going to be coming from, you know, debt, long-term debt or, or equity. And statement of shareholders equity just shows what's changed uh, in each of the accounts. Here's common stock started at zero. Here's our 60,000. Here's retained earnings, really important to know. Net income minus the dividends, a beginning balance plus net income minus 1,000 dividends, 1917. So shareholders can look at this uh, statement of share shareholders' equity and see what's happened. And finally, we're ready to close out. We've got everything done the income statement, the balance sheet um, is done. And now we're ready. The very last stage of the process is close out all the account, temporary accounts, and get ready to start the next accounting period. So the financial statements at this point are already done. They're already distributed to whoever wanted them. And now we're, we're on to getting ready for the next period. And so all the temporary accounts are set to zero. And how, would, how are they set to zero? The offsetting is transferred into retained earnings. Let's look at this. All the revenue accounts, remember revenue accounts have credit balances. We're gonna debit those by the exact amount they had in them. So they become, those revenue accounts now are equal to zero. And so these debits have a credit that's to retained earnings. 
and then look at all the expense accounts. We credit these all to zero. It's good to reset them to zero so we can start recording the next period's accounting expenses. Otherwise, uh, the expenses from two periods would be uh, commingled. That would not work when they do our next trial balance. And so when we credit all these uh, to take them to zero, we debit retained earnings. And so we look, uh, by the way, kind of interesting, uh, here's the debits and credits we just looked at. We get to 29.17 in retained earnings. Well, that was the balance of, of that income. So that's a good thing. But we still have one more temporary account. That's a dividend account that had a $1,000 debit balance. We got to credit that. That's another flow account, temporary account, set it to zero to so capture the dividends for the next period. And we debit retained earnings. Let's just stop here and pause and think about this for a minute. Um, a debit to retained earnings, does that increase or decrease uh, retained earnings? Does that increase or decrease equity? Well, retained earnings is part of equity and normally a credit balance for all the income that's been made. And so a debit reduces retained earnings. And that makes sense because what is retained earnings? All the net income plus minus the dividends. And so when we close out this dividend account, we are subtracting those dividends from the retained earnings account. So it now has uh, the correct balance. All right, last little section here is uh, we may uh, use some special journals. I would you know, be remiss to then talk about this. This makes it easy or easier for us. And so we may record all the same kind of entries into the same account. Um, a good example is a sales journal. We take all the credit cells and we post it in the sales journal, not directly to the journal ledger, because we're going to have a lot of these transactions. So they all go in the sales journal, and then at the end, we did, uh, at the end we take the subtotal. So here's the we didn't have many here. You could have thousands and millions of sales transactions, but if we add up all the the, the cells that we recorded in the sales journal, it's thirty two ninety five. So instead of posting each of these individually to the general ledger, we just post the total to the general ledger. And so there you go, 3295 credit to sales revenue and um, you know, debit to accounts receivable. So this is just a kind of a shortcut. And I talk about this only because uh, you may see this in, in companies you go to. So it uh, is a shortcut. And so that is it uh, for the second chapter. Again, this is pure review. You, if, if you're struggling with this, uh, you're gonna have to spend time uh, on this before, we, before you proceed with the rest of Intermediate One because it's gonna get a lot harder. This is the basic, easy stuff. So again, uh, thank you for your time today and I wish you the best.